Hey, Dr. Jeff LaCour with Compassio Medical Education. This video is an addendum to our article in the Journal of Urgent Care Medicine Beyond Otitis Media. We were only going to be able to put in about four to eight images, but we had about 30 to share, so they were kind enough to let me put out this video. So let's take a look. So this is normal anatomy we we're going to start with. This right here, the pink, is the pars tensa. It's a little bit more taut. The yellow is pars flaccida. That central depression is the umbo. And here's our light reflex right here. Truth be told, whether or not the light reflex is present or not, it doesn't really tell me much. So let's move on to some of our conditions. The most common thing you're going to see that looks abnormal is moringosclerosis. If you look right here, this almost looks like a meniscus of fluid, but it's not. It's calcification often coming from chronic inflammation of the ear. Look right here. This is a big old calcification that some might even think is a cholesteatoma. Right here, these are our patients that often come in that said they were treated with multiple courses of antibiotics because they have constant recurrent infections or fluid. But guess what? That's not fluid. This is actually moringosclerosis right here, and it gives the illusion that there's bubbles right here. Same thing on this ear right here. Moringosclerosis right here, which is giving the illusion of bubbles. So there's no fluid. And this one is more extensive moringosclerosis. This is a right ear. Look at all of this scarring right here. It may even give the illusion that this is a perforation, but it's not. Same thing right here. This is a horseshoe of moringosclerosis. May give the illusion that there's a hole right there, but it's not. You don't have to refer these patients to the ENT provider unless they're complaining of hearing loss. Moving on, retraction pockets. They're gonna most commonly be up here at the pars flaccida or in the posterior superior aspect of the tympanic membrane. This is a right ear. It's really thin because there's eustachian tube dysfunction and it's pulling in that portion of the tympanic membrane. Here's a left ear, same thing. It's very thin, might even look like a perforation, but it's not. It's a retraction pocket. Here's a severely retracted pocket. This is a right ear showing the stapes. You shouldn't see that. And these patients should be referred to the ENT. All right, this is our patient from before. I wanted to show you this. I actually had the patient clear his ear and notice how thin that portion of the eardrum is. That's why it looks like a perforation sometimes. Here we are having him suck in and then blow out again. And you can see it's a very thin tympanic membrane. All right, moving on. Next up, cholesteatoma. You definitely wanna refer these patients to the ENT provider as well. The most common locations, the same place as retraction pockets, pars flaccida and posterior superior aspect of the TM. Here's one on the left ear. This is posterior superior. It's kind of eroding into that space right there. It's basically epidermis that's going into the middle ear. Here's one right here. This is a right ear, and you can see that whole pars flaccida and going into the posterior superior quadrant right here is eroding that bone. These patients need to be referred. Another place where they might form is through an existing TM perforation. Here's a right ear with a TM perforation, and a cholesteatoma is starting to form right here. Here's another perforation right here, and look at this nice pearly cholesteatoma. That comes from the migration of epithelium into that tympanic membrane perforation. This is courtesy of Dr. Neil Jackson at Tulane University. All right, moving on. Serous otitis media can come in numerous flavors. Look at this patient right here. Very subtle amber fluid right here with a meniscus right here. This is normal TM. This is fluid from here down. Over here, we've got a middle ear full of fluid. That's all serous amber fluid. Moving on, this one's pretty easy. You've got bubbles there with all this amber fluid. And look at this one, a right ear. It's almost blue, but that again is just middle ear fluid. This patient came in a right ear and I thought it was pus and I actually had to open this up, but I was wrong. This is actually fluid under pressure. And now we're getting into our otitis media right here. This is a bulging TM right there. That's a giveaway, otitis media. This is a one-year-old right here. Nice bulging, nice bulging tympanic membrane full of pus. And what I want you to watch is when we watch it, he actually let me film. Notice the pulsations of that middle ear from the pus under pressure. All right, moving on. Tympanic membrane perforations. Here's a left ear with a pretty big, I would say almost 40% TM perforation and that posterior inferior quadrant there. Pretty obvious. This was a little bit more subtle. This is a traumatic TM perforation. I would refer these patients to the ENT provider just to get their hearing checked. And lastly, here's another TM perforation, another traumatic. That's gonna heal no problem. 
And then this is one I was duped on. I thought this was a hole, but that's actually a really thin layer of tympanic membrane, and it wasn't a hole. So what are some tips I use to help? Is there a hole? Is there not a hole? Is that fluid? Is it not fluid? It's tympanometry. These patients that we showed earlier with moringosclerosis, if I did a tympanogram on them, the eardrum would move from that pressure and it would give me a normal type A tympanogram. Same here with the one I thought was a perforation. That would be a type A. How about that retracted eardrum? You might even thought that was a perforation right there. Well, it's actually an intact eardrum and it would give me a negative pressure type C tympanogram. And lastly, fluid. Is that fluid? Is it not fluid? We did a tympanogram on this patient and it's a flat tympanogram, which means there's fluid. I highly recommend any urgent care or primary care out there, get a tympanometer and learn how to do this because you'll become way better diagnosticians. I hope you found this helpful. If you haven't already done so, please check out our article in the Journal of Urgent Care Medicine.